Hey, what's going on, champs? I'm Erin Deliosa. Welcome to an Immigrant's Life podcast, my podcast about immigrants and immigration and everything in between. Thank you for listening and downloading the show, and thank you for supporting my dad. You already know, new week, new episode. But, of course, we can start the episode without me thanking you, Immigrant Nation. You guys have been so generous and kind to the podcast with your sharing, liking, and giving the podcast a five-star rating. I really appreciate you and your support. It means a lot to me. As for the ones who haven't followed us on social media, please go ahead and do so. Our handle is at an immigrant's life. Most importantly, hit that subscribe button on all the podcast platform and YouTube since that's the best way to support us. Hassle-free and you get notified whenever a new episode comes out. Now, let's talk about this week's episode. Spring is at full swing here in Canada, so I figured I'd invite a guest that has been blooming so much after surviving domestic violence and even cancer. You will love and admire this beautiful flower of a woman, guaranteed. I've said enough. So, without further ado, let's get into the show. Isa, dalawa, tatlo. Today's guest is an interior architect and an artist. Like the cotton flower, her art represents healing. And like the sunflower, her heart always turns towards the sun. Everyone, please welcome Camila Erkaboyeva. Hello, hello, assalamu alaikum. That was such a lovely introduction. I loved it. Thank you. I did my best. <laughs> I loved it. You, you definitely did your research as well. Uh, I try. You you definitely stalks me. <laughs> I do. I, I'm bad at that. <laughs> oh, it's fine. I'm I'm usually the FBI in every friends group, so it's fine. It's usually yeah. me that does the all the stalking. I love when I ask a question to the guest, and the guest is like, "How do you know that?" Oh, okay. I wonder what kind of questions you're gonna ask me. Now. Oh, basic, basic, basic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. First of all, before we move on, I want to say thank you for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for inviting. It's a pleasure to be here and it's an honor as well. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on again, if you want to promote anything, go ahead. Yes. Um, whoever's listening, I have my own art page, my own website. I sell my artwork. It's Artsy Numpty. So yes, give me a follow. Give me a shout. Drop me a DM. I love her artwork, by the way. For all the listeners, you got to check it out. It's beautiful. Thank you. And the website is just, it's art. Ah, oh, yay. I'm so happy to hear this. Like it's everything <laughs> about it, you know? Oh, yay. It, it took me a while to get there. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I finally did this last year. It took me many years. I was procrastinating a lot, but yay. <laughs> was a fear yeah it's a lot of anxiety a lot of fear i the thing is all of these drawings right they're very colorful they're very vibrant they're full of you know florals but there's so many dark stories behind it and no one knows and i used to think oh shit like who will want to buy my artwork like they're kind of dark mm -hmm. but not a lot of people know these stories and they resonate in their own way and a lot of people that have bought my artwork um they tell me these stories and it's completely different to my dog stories. <laughs> so so I'm I'm happy. Um I'm happy that I finally did this and I'm funny that is happening. So yeah. Mm. Going back to what you just said two seconds ago about people sharing their stories to you. You said their stories are darker. How do you feel when they tell you that that their stories are darker? Do you feel guilt? Or do you feel like, yeah, that's the cross they carry, this is the cross I carry? Um, I definitely feel connected because my artwork is not, you know, it's not just a pretty photo to look at. It's a bridge between myself and other people. It's a communication. Mm. Um, and for me, sometimes it was a healing process I was going through and I was putting it on paper because I couldn't speak to anyone at the time or something that was very hard to speak about. Mm. Um it was on paper. So when people share the stories that they've been through, they themselves couldn't communicate 
or they themselves couldn't express what they've been through. And once they see the photo, they resonate and they feel um, they feel heard. And when they tell me the stories that some of them have mentioned and shared, they're very dark sometimes. And sometimes it's darker than my stories. Mm. And I just want to give them a hug, to be honest, and just to let them know that they're not alone. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Yes, that, exactly. Because sometimes we just, when we feel those things, we just sit down and like, no one cares. No one understands me. No one's going through this same thing that I'm going through. But obviously mm -hmm. it's not true. It's definitely not true. And um, we all have this stage in us. We all have these moments, the situations where it feels like life is too much where it feels like we're drowning, it feels like we're suffocating, it feels like we're all alone, but that's not the reality. Mm. You know, you might be walking next to someone on the street and they might be going through something even worse or something very similar to you. You mm. never know how close you actually are with someone. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we live in a, such a fast-paced world. Um, it feels like a photo, a picture, a drawing is, is the quickest way to communicate to someone and to feel connected to someone. Yeah, I love it. We'll go deeper later, but first, I'd like to know where was Camilla originally planted? <laughs> Camilla was originally planted in Tashkent, the capital city of Uzbekistan in Central Asia. Um, yep, and I moved to London. I, as you can hear by my accent, I live in London. Hmm. And when did you move to London? I was 11 years old when I moved to London. Okay. Um, there's a there's a great story behind uh, how I moved to London. Mm. My parents always wanted to move uh, abroad, to immigrate abroad. We're mm. from a very simple working class family. And after the collapse of Soviet Union in the 90s, it was really hard for a lot of families, naturally. But for ours specifically, it was really hard because um, we didn't have any connections. Um, we weren't exactly wealthy. and my parents believe in honest living. So they worked a lot um, in order to survive and in order to provide for us. And ever since I remember from the young age, they always wanted to immigrate to London or mm. USA. Ever since I, like, I was a kid. And even before I was born, they were planting this mission. Um, they, they were visualizing and manifesting this and they were very proactive in this. And yeah, they have, they have accomplished. Congratulations. Some people think it's such an easy task to do, but it's like almost, almost impossible. Yes, exactly. It's almost impossible. And back then it was only possible if you're from wealthy families. Um, for family like ours, you know, completely normal working class, um, mm. making our honest living, that it seemed it was very impossible back then. I honestly don't know how my parents still believed mm. in their dream and they never gave up. It took them 10 years, but they never gave up. Wow. It took a lot of rejections, yeah. They were rejected many times. My mom was rejected her visa two, two times or three times. My dad was rejected four times. We were rejected, my, my brother and I, three times as well before we moved here. <laughs> so And then they were, never, ever gave up. They just carried on with the mission. That's amazing. What did they do for a living then? Um, they were engineers. Um, mm -hmm. But after the collapse in the 90s, my dad was working two jobs at the time. Um, my mom, well, she was a housewife. She was looking after us. But once she used to put us to sleep, she was uh, teaching herself English at night mm -hmm. and um, making baking cakes to sell to help somehow financially. And then later on, my mom started working in a company that used to send kids from wealthy Uzbek families to London to study, to college or universities. And actually, that's the story how my mom got here. It was my mom first who came to London. Because of the company that she was working in, she taught herself how to do it, the process, the documents needed. She became friends with some of the people that were at the MPC, British Embassy in Tashkent. Mm. And she sent her own self as a student that way to college in London in her uh, like her late thirties when we were little. Ass. I, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. like James Bond over here. 
I know. My parents were really fighting it. They were going in every every possible way to get here. Wow. I saw a post of you that in Uzbekistan you are forced to do forced labor. Yes. Um it was it was basically uh during during the Soviet Union, during um the times when my parents were students, universities, they used to be sent to um cotton fields mm. to work for forced labor. Even as students university, you know, they were doing they were studying engineering. What's it got to do <laughs> with their degrees? But the government was enforcing the labor and to collect cotton. And they were they even used to be marked on how much cotton they were collecting, what which the- used to directly affect their grades and used to affect their um degrees. That's I know, crazy. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. And only recently, after uh, the new government was introduced six years ago, um, that they started to make these changes to stop the forced labor. I mean, it's still, I feel like it's still going to come into the effect within a year mm. or maybe two years, but it's still a change. However small it is, it's still a change, and we should celebrate it. Of course, of course. I remember when I was in the Philippines, I was going through university. Mm-hmm. It's not the same. It's not as hard, but it's still, you know, frustrating. You have to go to this uh, ROTC, Reserve Officer Training something. Okay. You Every Saturday, you go to your university and you act like a soldier. You march with a wooden stick. Every Saturday, you have your army uniform. Like, mm-hmm. And I'm like, why are we doing this? I'm not trying to you know, be a soldier. Why? But it came from World War II. When there was war, they need men to fight. And they were thinking that, okay, if we train these guys, at least they know how mm. to march. Apparently, marching can kill people. But anyways. <laughs> and I fucking hated it. Hated it. Because you have to stand there for an hour. Your back will hurt, you know. Like... You march for no reason at all, you know? Mm. Again, it's not like what your parents did. They're picking cotton. <laughs> well, actually, it's, we actually have compulsory army training for young men in Uzbekistan too. At the certain, once you turn a certain age, once you turn 18, and if you're not in education um, or if you're not working, I think, it's compulsory to do the army training. And in mm. Turkey, the same thing. And the compulsory army training is usually for a few months. So imagine, even if you go to university, mm. they will still the government will still ask you to do the compulsory army training. Yeah, but for us, it's like a fake army. We're not really holding yeah, guns. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. It's just like right. we're, you know, like young kids decided to march. Things like yeah. that, you know? Like it wasn't, we're studying about guns, but we never held a gun. Like little silly things <laughs> like that. And, like, and also, by the way, if God forbid the Philippines got into a war with, I don't know, US, in a push mm. of a button, Philippines will be Finnish. Like, I hope not. You, no, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, what am I, I going to do? do? I'm, a, I'm a dude just marching. I don't even know how to do anything. It's so, I, I, it, but by the way, they got rid of that law like a few years ago, which I was so happy about. Oh, yay. Yeah, but I'm, again, I'm happy that this silly forced labor law is, you know, eradicated. Yeah, it, it in came into your... place. Yeah. yeah. Do you have siblings? I do. I have an um, older brother, six years older than me. Yeah. Six years? Was that planned? Oh, no, 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 it wasn't. No, it wasn't planned at all. No. <laughs> So when he ha- when they had him, they weren't planning you. <laughs> yes, I was. I was a pleasant surprise in their lives. <laughs> a very pale, pleasant surprise. <laughs> yes, I have an older brother who looks nothing like me at all. Mm. Um, my mother is Russian. She is a second generation of uh, Russians in her family that was born and raised in Uzbekistan, and. Um, she has blue eyes, um, light brown hair. And my mm. dad is very Uzbek. He has an Uzbek fro. Um, <laughs> I can show you a photo later. Mm. He has dark skin, brown eyes. And I look a bit like my dad, except that I'm pale. And my brother looks very Russian, <laughs> like very Russian. 
<laughs> he stands out in all the family gatherings that we have. <laughs> oh yeah. Everyone <laughs> yes, and he was born blonde with blue eyes as well. Uh people used to ask my dad if um that's a adopted child. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm sure he looks like mom. Yeah, now he looks like mom. Yeah, but him and I will look nothing alike at all. So, who's mom's favorite? Don't ask me these things. <laughs> <laughs> It's obviously me. <laughs> That's funny. So, how was your childhood like growing up in Uzbekistan? Um. It was happy. It was multicultural. We were we lived in the neighborhood in Tashkent um, called Chilanzar. If you, if anyone who's listening, um, the area is basically well known for for it to be multicultural. Mm. My neighborhood, my mahalla, was full of Tatars, Koreans, Ukrainians, Armenians, um, Turkmens, Tajiks, Azerbaijanis, not just Uzbeks, and. We all used to play around as children in the neighborhood, like chasing around, celebrating um, Easter, eat together. It was lovely. I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, There were no friction between the cultures. No, I mean, come on, we're children. Well, <laughs> there the was definitely adults. no friction. Adults, um, even if there was, I've, I've never witnessed it. I've never seen it. Um, we were all very friendly. Mm -hmm. Never, never experienced it. There was no bullying, like, "Hey, you're Korean. You you don't belong here." No, no, quite <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> quite the opposite. In every gathering that we had, um, we always had Korean salads. We always had Azerbaijani sweets. We obviously always had Uzbek plov, um, Russian salads. The table was always multicultural, mm. just like our neighborhood. That's It was beautiful. nice, and I loved it. Yeah. Did you guys practice religion? Um. Yes. Um. My dad is a Muslim, mm. and he was Muslim from the very young age. Um, my mother, she was actually she she didn't believe in God when they got married, actually, and she mm. only uh, baptized uh, she got baptized when she was in her thirties after I was born, actually. <laughs> and but there was no friction, there were no arguments. In fact, my dad loved celebrating Easter. Um, not the religious part of it, obviously. He was very careful about that. But the whole, you know, the feasts, the food, he loved it. Um, and he was only pro for the fact that my mom was into religion and she became an Orthodox Christian because at least she was, she believed into something. And there was no friction between like, hey, you need to be Muslim or you have to be Orthodox Christian. No, no, not at all. Um, they were very open-minded and they never forced or enforced a religion on us at all. Um, my mom would take me to church secretly um, <laughs> when I was a kid. For instance, if it was Easter, um, she would be like, come on, it's Sunday. It's Sunday, we have to go. I'm like, where are we going? Shh, we have to go. <laughs> and I was not allowed to tell my dad. Um, and my dad... Um, He was also, he was teaching me about Islam a lot um, mm. when I was a kid. And he got me my first hijab. Mm. Um, but he never asked me to wear it. He just got it out of um, cursity, for instance, if we have to go to a formal gathering, for instance, funeral, you have to cover up um, just out of respect. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, no, never enforced anything. That's beautiful. Let me ask you yeah. about the hijab. Like, Yeah, yeah. Is that? Is that cultural or is that based on religion? Is is based on religion. However, in my um, Uzbek side of family, the only person that wears a hijab was my uh, Buvijan, my grandma from my dad's side, um, mm -hmm. because she was at the age she was pretty old. So she, ever since I was a kid, I've always remembered her wearing a headscarf, mm -hmm. and also she was a widower. So I thought maybe that was the reason as well. Um, although she did pray um, all the time, and she was she she, she practiced Islam um, religiously. <laughs> mm. Can we talk about Buvijan? My Buvijan, yes. I know she was the reason for your, some of your artwork. Yes. Um, oh, I got I got shivers just talking about her. Um, my Buvijan, uh, 
she died last year. Hmm. Uh, um, she was at the age, she was in her mid nineties and, uh, thank God she lived a long life. Um, and when she died, I had this huge amount of guilt. Hmm. Um, not, not because I've missed the last ever call from her because I was at work and she was calling me with dad and I was like, Oh, I cannot talk right now. I'll talk to you later. Hmm. And unfortunately, by the time I got back to my dad, um, my dad said she, she passed away. She she felt that she was leaving and she she was saying goodbye to everyone but we thought that is her you know her being old and stuff and being mm. turning a little bit crazy mm. um but no she she felt the death coming and i felt this huge amount of guilt not just because i lost my loved one and i missed a call but also because i've never had a proper conversation with her mm. like i grew up and growing up i always used to visit her all the time, even after we moved to London, we used to visit Uzbekistan twice a year. Mm. And every year um, we made sure that I'm visiting her. But I spoke very broken, broken Uzbek and she spoke very broken Russian. <laughs> so all the conversations, uh, there were all the questions that were very, uh, how do I say, conventional and I knew what's coming basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had this huge amount of guilt that I never got around to learn Uzbek properly like I always wanted and I could procrastinate in that. And when she died, I was like, you know what? If not now, when? I mm. need to do this. So I start getting back into my culture, learning more um, about traditions. I got myself a tutor to learn Uzbek properly. And mm. I started to draw more of um, like Uzbek, um, Tur Turkish, Turk related drawings. So mm -hmm. yeah, she's behind the reason. I love it. I love it. My grandma passed away too last year, awesome. and she Sorry was. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. She was. She raised me since I was like a baby. I was so yeah. close to her, and I loved when you said that because of Bouvijon, it pushed you to learn more about your culture. Yes, and that's the same effect with me with my grandma. I used to be mm. close to the culture, and then I moved to Canada. I kind of like go far, and then when she passed, I'm like. And start thinking about her and my life. And I'm like, that woman taught me everything. Yeah. Like all the respect for the, for nature, all the, you know, the old ways. She taught yeah. me everything. Like I love hiking. I do. I uh -huh. enjoy hiking. Where I got it from? From her. Oh. And I just realized like, oh shit. Remember when I was young, she used to bring me to the mountains. Yeah. And that's how I get from, you know. But yeah, I mean, my sympathies for you and the family. Was she sick, Bouvijan? Thank you. No, she wasn't sick at all. She, <laughs> I've never seen my grandma, my Bouvijan sick. Mm. Like she, she, she died in her mid nineties. Honestly, mashallah, because you know. she was so short. Like. She she was such a small petite Uzbek woman, mm. and she birthed eight children, eight healthy children, and six of them were men, my uncles. And let me tell you, they're not as short as my brother John, especially my dad. My dad is the tallest; he's the youngest boy in the family. He was the biggest and the tallest and the fastest baby. How <laughs> so I always how short? I always she was. Oh God, I think she was. She wasn't even five foot, or maybe like she was. She was tiny, like even. When I was 11 years old or 12 years old, I had to bow down to kiss her cheek. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how short she was. Um, so, yeah, she wasn't sick at all. She was healthy and um, she knew it was coming. So mm -hmm. she was saying goodbye to everyone. Mm -hmm. What is your best memory of Bouvi John? Oh, God. I think it's <laughs> every time when I used to visit her, um, Oh, that's already when I moved to London. And I remember when I was a teenager, mm. I used to come to her house um, with dad and she always used to um, have a table ready, especially for my dad. My dad loves Uzbek mantu. That's his favorite dish ever. And only my Bubi John can make it perfectly well, obviously, because that's his of mother. Of course. So my dad eats a huge plate of mantu. <laughs> and then he, he, has, he goes into a food coma and goes for a nap. <laughs> and me and Bubba John and I end up cleaning obviously I'm the youngest and the lady in the house so I clean everything and then Bubba John sits me down 
and she would always um, come up to me very carefully and very quietly. She was like, "Eh, Camilla, home, parim borma," which translates as, um, "Camilla, do you have a boyfriend?" <laughs> and I was, you know, fourteen. Fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was fourteen or you know, fifteen at the time. I, I don't think I even held a boy's hand um, at that age. And I, I would go red. I would, I would be like, "No, but we John haram, haram, no, York, parim York." And then she, with her broken Russian, she'll be like, eh, "Uzbek, Uzbek parim, Uzbek parim." I'm like, "No, no." And as the years go by, the question remained the same. <laughs> so you know, I'm 16, I'm 17, I'm 18, I'm 20. Always, eh, Kamila Ham parim borma. The the only thing that changed is the requirements so after a few years she was like muslim muslim party muslim she didn't even care who's uzbek anymore she cared as long as he's muslim she'll be fine with that <laughs> so that's my favorite memory of all like she would always ask me this question her in her hijab you know this uzbek like petite mm-hmm. a sweet old lady you know yeah. that prays uh four or five times a day come up to me and like ask me this question that's that's why I, <laughs> I think that's my sweetest memory of her. Yeah. That's I love that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. What has helped you the most in your grief? I think it's um learning the language mm-hmm. and um drawing, um, paying my respects. Um I think yeah, it's it's that. It's me becoming closer to my culture because I always longed for that connection with her. Um, even when I was two or three years old, um, we lived in a one bedroom flat in Tashkent um, and she used to come to visit us. And I was a baby. I remember I was two or three years old mm. and she used to come into my bedroom in the middle of the day when I used to nap, take my naps. Um, and she used to pray and I used to watch her. I loved watching her pray. And the next thing you know, um, my mom found me in a closet with a towel on my head, you know, mimicking the hijab, mm. praying, <laughs> praying in a closet. And that, that's that's because I didn't know how to connect with her. So I thought maybe it's religion, you know, mm. even as a baby. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe it's the language. And I think um, once after she died and after I processed it, I think it's the fact that I'm paying my respects through the culture and me connecting back to my culture. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love <laughs> Thank that. You. Now, I spoke yes. to Blue Vision last night and she told me to <laughs> ask you this. Do you have a boyfriend? Haram, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I know. I, you know, I... I don't know if do you like do you know Star Wars? N- not much, not much. Okay, but so in Star Wars, they're like when the Jedi passes, uh-huh. they don't really pass; they're just there. Yeah, and th- it's so true with these amazing women in their lives. They don't mm-hmm. really leave. They like every day. I talk to my grandma every day. Yes, you know, and I'm push. I'm sure you do as well. Yes, that's how I speak. I speak through my artwork. I speak through this uh, collection that I'm mm. paying respect from my Uzbek drawings, from my Turk collection, mm-hmm. from me learning. Yeah, I speak with her that way. Do you have a conversation, like actual conversation with her? No. You just threw it. Yeah, I'm, I'm avoiding the question. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I do... With my grandma, I, I do have conversation with her. Every time I'm going through things, anxiety, uh-huh. you know. You uh-huh. know, the amazing depression that always comes mm. out of nowhere. I'll be like, yo, help me out here. I don't know what to do. And mm. it's like, I don't know if it's faith or whatever you want to call it. It's just like, everything's going to be okay, you know? Yeah. You know, my grandma taught me, my Burijan actually taught me this. Like when you have a really bad dream. Mm. Um, talk to water so she would say uh, fill in um, a bowl of water or like even in the sink um, mm. and, and speak speak to the water tell the story tell the dream the bad dream that you've had let it all go let it like wash out 
And that's when it comes to me when I have anxiety sometimes or I have really bad thoughts or something bad happened. I speak towards her, cleanse it out and rinse it away. So, I, I mean, I guess I guess I talk to her that through that as well. Mm-hmm. It's funny because my grandma used to say, if you have a bad dream, drink a glass of water and then pray and then go back to the... It's the same thing. It's water. Water is purifying. Um, mm-hmm. It's the water and the fire. Mm. Let's go back to your immigration story. Yeah, let's go back. So you came to London when you were 11. How long did you wait when mom moved and then you guys moved? So mom um, came to London as a student to study in college. Um, I must have been seven or eight. And we moved when we were 11 and three or four years. And as soon as my mom got on that plane to London, that's when the preparation started for us. That's when we started having intensive English lessons. That's hmm. when we started watching documentaries and all the Hugh Grant films <laughs> with dad. <laughs> my dad was forcing Bridget Jones on me. Oh my he, was, he was so inappropriate. He was like, Kami, look, this is going to be your life. I'm like, no, I don't want to be this sad uh, lady. <laughs> I, I will have my own apartment. Hell yeah. Hmm. But I don't want to be hmm. a sad little lady like her. <laughs> but yeah, we watched Hugh Grant, Hugh Grant films and we watched a lot of documentaries on the royal family and we had intensive english lessons three times a week for the past three years before we moved why you grant i don't know i think it's because he's such an idol for the british culture i mean notting hill um what else were there (laughs) uh love actually my dad loves love actually (laughs) so um every every time um there's like a um, oh, actually, no, my dad likes, what is that film? I forgot, with Hugh Grant in it. And there's a, a little boy. Um, about a boy? Yes, about a boy. <laughs> <laughs> my dad loves the scene with a duck. And he's like, Camilla, let's go um, Let's go to the park and feed the ducks. I'm like, no, but I don't want to feed the ducks the way that little boy fed, fed the ducks. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so I grew up watching these films um, in preparation to move to London. So when you moved to London, how was your English? Oh, God. I, you know, I listened to one of your podcasts and you mentioned you can never be ready for the cultural shock. And mm. that's when I realized, you know, all these preparations throughout the years, I was not ready. <laughs> I, I thought I had a good English until I moved to London. Mm. Hell no, I didn't. There were so many different accents, so many different cultures and ethnicities, so many different dialects, you know. Mm. Someone says water, someone else says water. You know, it's just like I was I was dying. I had such an anxiety for a week. I didn't leave my room for a week when I first moved to London. And then um, I was bullied as well in school for mm. not ha- speaking English properly and having an accent. So, yeah, it, it, it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't as good as I thought it was at all. When you were being bullied, culture shock, all those dark days. Uh-huh. What did you do to push through? Well, I drew. I always drew mm. um, ever since I was seven years old. And during that period of time, I also drew. But when it comes to me being bullied in school, um, it just really made me angry. Like looking back at it, I was so angry. You know, I'm being bullied for one small little thing. Well, obviously, it's a big thing. Language is a big thing. But, you know, I realized when I was a kid, it doesn't matter how smart, kind, warm, polite you are. No one will take you seriously if your language is not perfect or if Mm. you don't have a perfect accent. Mm. So I was so angry and I was so determined to be taken seriously. Um, I started uh, watching British films, British um, programs. I started reading in English only, even if it was written by a Russian author, I was still reading in English. Hmm. I was so determined to learn English perfectly well with the British accent so people can take me seriously hmm. that I, was, I I accomplished it within two years. When I was 13, I had a perfect English, British accent. And all of my friends were um, English, British, from British families. Hmm. Um, I think what helped me, apart from my artwork, is the fact that I was very proactive. Mm. I'm so stubborn. I was like, no, I, I will be taken seriously and I'll do anything and everything that I can. 
to be taken seriously. No one can use that against me. Mm -hmm. I think that's 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 it. Me being proactive. It was very impressive. Did you make friends in school? I did. Yes, I did. Um, the school I went to, um, my mom enrolled me into the British secondary school that was specifically um, emphasized on art. And um, a lot of kids there, were, some of them were mixed. So there, there were a lot of different cultures, but I was the only one who spoke Russian in the mm. whole in the whole school. I was the only Russian speaker um, at the time. Um, but yeah, I did make friends. I had a group of, a good group of British friends, English friends. Yeah. Wow. Can we talk about your cancer? Yes, we can. <laughs> How would you like to phrase it? How would you like to start? <laughs> How did you get diagnosed? Um, I was 16. 16? Um, yeah. So first symptoms started when I was 16. Um, at first, it was neurological, uh, mental symptoms like with what? mental health, and I well, it was like insomnia, um, having apathy. I had um, really weird mood swings, and I and I thought, okay, maybe it's because there's a lot going on at home. Um, there was the situation at home wasn't perfect either. My mom remarried, mm. and I didn't like the stepdad at all, and there was a lot of. Um, bad things happening at home as well, as well as school and stuff like that. So I thought maybe that's affecting me. And then physical symptoms came in. Um, I was throwing up a lot. I was losing a lot of weight and hair. Um, and I realized it got really bad when one day I woke up to go to college and start my day in the morning and I couldn't. I was in so much pain, like stomach pain. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the bathroom, I ran to the bathroom I quickly realized that I was internally bleeding and Whoa. yeah, I lost a lot of blood and I passed out and thank God my mom was at home in the morning and she was the one who was like, yeah, that's it. We got, we're going to the hospital. And I was like, no mom, you know, it's one of, I have a, I have a day in college. I have to start. It was my first day in college. I have to go. She's yeah. like, are you dumb? <laughs> we're going to college. Uh, we're going to hospital. Mm -hmm. And thank God, we did because once I got to the hospital and they'd done all the checks on me, they said, if you didn't come on time, you, you, you could have died within two hours because it was very intense. It was intense. Mm. You lost a lot of blood. And that was my life. Um, I was in hospital for two weeks, internally bleeding and me waiting to stop internally bleeding. And then another two weeks of the month trying to live my life normally and carry on with college and studies and that was my life for at least five to six months before I was diagnosed. Two weeks in hospital, internally bleeding. Two weeks, normal life in college, living my own life. Holy shit, dude. Yeah. What's know, causing the internal bleeding? Um, it was the tumor. They found a tumor um, that was in my pancreas and attached to um, my liver. Mm. And it was pretty big by the time they found it. It was because it was so deep down, they couldn't find it. They were doing so many different tests. They couldn't find it. The only thing that did find it was the ultrasound, you know, with the pregnant ladies that they do, they have. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and by the time they found the tumor, it was the size of a tennis ball. It was pretty huge. That yes. is massive. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was. It was massive by the time they found it. And as soon as they found it, that's when they were like, okay, that's it. Uh, we are sending you to a specialized hospital that focuses on oncology department. We don't know if it's cancer or not, but it's huge. And because you're internally bleeding heavily, um, we need to get the situation ace up and done and dusted. And you're 17. So, and I didn't have a history of oncology in my whole family, mm. not even diabetes, not even heart diseases, nothing. We, we don't have that running in our family. Mm. So that's why it was a big shock. And my parents were very, um, how do I say it? They were. They didn't believe it either. They were like, "No, hell no!" Like, yeah. how can our daughter? Like, she's healthy and fine. I, I guess <laughs> they were like, "Yeah, she's a, a little extra pale sometimes, but there's no way. <laughs> there's no way she has a tumor growing inside of her." Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. They they were in denial until I had my final surgery. Yeah. They were, they they refused to believe it. That's just me. Me being a parent. God forbid that happens to my kid. I hope not, obviously. God forbid. God forbid. 
it's that's the first thing you do is like you you're in a denial because it reflects on you that you feel that you have failed yeah but it's you know it's it's not something that could have controlled it's you know it, no one could have foreseen it at all i mean yes i had stomach pains yes i was throwing up but you know i was sick when i was three years old and i had um an infection in my stomach and i was um i was severely ill so they thought mm. oh maybe it's something similar to that you know mm. there was a stomach bug or something but they didn't think that it's something as serious as that and you can never control it yeah you can't that that's why it's illogical but as a parent you can't yeah. stop but feeling that you're like oh, i right, failed yeah. i have failed myself and my child yeah they actually did take it a lot on themselves mm. i agree with that they did but hey the positive story the positive light out of this i got to beat uh, prince william out of that story <laughs> what? how oh, no, wait <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's showing me a mug that shows her and <laughs> Prince William with hair. <laughs> yes, with hair. Exactly. That's that's how long it was. <laughs> wow. That's how vintage it, it was. Um, the company at uh, the hospital that I was uh, I was in that was specializing on oncology. Um, they the president of that hospital was Princess Diana um, mm. before she died. So if you watch the story, the watch the film Diana, you will know it, it's actually the real story. There's a Royal Brompton Hospital and the Royal Marston Hospital, and mm. I was in Royal Marston Hospital, and there was a huge portrait of her there. And I was like, why? Why is there a portrait of Diana? I mean, I love her. My whole family mm. loves her, but I never realized it, that she was the president. And after she died, Prince William became the president of the hospital. So he does a lot of fundraising, and he has, actually does visit the um, the patients um, that are going through it. And I remember I was in a hospital for at least a month before my first surgery. Um, and I, I mean, obviously I wasn't fine, but I was fine. I was walking around and stuff like that. And then the second surgery, the big one where they, they will actually remove the tumor and they might cut half, half of my organ to make sure I'm alive. <laughs> my dad came to London for that. Mm. And I remember my dad, um, he was very anxious and nervous. We kept a very secret for, um, from him because he lives in Uzbekistan. Mm. Still, um, I didn't tell my dad how serious the situation was. My mother uh, was too scared. She thought, it's, you know, she was in denial. She was mm. like, there's no way she's sick. So mm. my dad only came for the second surgery, the big one. And I remember the day that he came is the day of my surgery. He couldn't make it on time. And he was drinking a lot on the airplane because he was so scared. <laughs> Cause he couldn't come down. He was drinking a lot. So when he came, he was, um, he wasn't so well, he was a hangover. Thanks, and then Dad. I told him, thanks yeah, for the support. Thanks. <laughs> so anyway, it was my, uh, the, the day I got out, out of the, uh, the, the surgery. Mm. And I was like, dad, come, come the next day, uh, sleep well, come the next day in the morning. Um, and then in the morning before my parents were visiting me, um, the staff member came, like a head staff member into mm. intensive care unit. Mm. Um, and she goes up to me, she was like, you got to have a special visitor coming today. And I'm like, what? And I thought I was high because after the surgery, they staff you with morphine and everything. I had seven mm. tubes in my body. So I thought I'm dreaming. I, yeah, I had seven tubes in my body, like different Ooh. parts of my body, my neck, uh, my stomach, everywhere. It was, oh. it was everywhere. I thought I'm, I'm just high, you know, I thought, um, I, I cannot tell the difference between the reality and dreaming. Mm -hmm. So, she, and then she carries on talking, and I'm like, "Who's who's a special person? Who is this? It's like it's some it's a member of the royal family, but we don't know who exactly yet. But mm -hmm. do not tell anyone. But we've got to make sure you're prepared. And this is my second day after surgery. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, um, interesting. And then my parents come in, and this is my dad's first day in London, technically. And I go to my dad. <laughs> I was like, Dad. I'm going to have a special visitor coming today. And he looks at me like, okay, um, fine. My daughter is high, probably. <laughs> I was like, no, no, dad, dad, it's, it's, a, it's a royal family. And he starts laughing. And my mom look at, looks at him and she starts laughing. I'm like, guys, like seriously, the royal family is coming to visit me. <laughs> and they didn't believe me until 
the nurse that was looking after me in the intensive care unit um, confirmed it. And that's mm. when my mom took a day off from work <laughs> and they started preparing me. Mm. My mom got Miss Chanel perfume <laughs> to, make sure, <laughs> to make sure I smell nice. They, they washed my hair. They, um, like, uh, like uh try to wash me i mean i had seven tubes in my body like it was impossible to wash me no, no. i was like there's no way my childhood crush prince william will see me like this you guys make sure i'm prepared and it was it was lucky for my dad i mean first day in london and you visit and you mm-hmm. see a royal family member of royal family meeting him mm-hmm. and my dad i remember he came with souvenirs from Uzbekistan for the nurses to give it to us he was like no no i'm going to keep them for the prince william <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I remember I was I was very high in morphine and my parents are uh, like waiting and uh, the member of uh, from the royal family, like the representative came in and he was mm. like, oh, um, make sure that you're very calm and make sure you don't say like royal highness. He likes to keep it casual. I'm like, mm. okay, cool. So he comes in and he was wearing this white, uh, I think he was wearing yeah, a white shirt, like very simple jeans. And my dad like got up and like gave him um, the handshake. My mom got all right as well. And and then he comes up to me and I'm like, hey, Wills. (laughs) 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 I was I was too scared to say hi, Prince William or hi, William. My anxiety and the morphine in my blood. I was like, oh, hey, Wills. (laughs) What did he say? Oh, he was like, oh, hi, hello. And yeah, and we spoke for maybe 20 minutes. Um, Mm. It was the day when he found out that his wife is pregnant with the first kid. Mm. So, and it was very secret. Uh, The media didn't know yet. There were just talks and he was like, by the way, I might be a dad. And I was like, no way. I know. And he was like showing me photos that Kate was taking. She loved photography. And Mm. I told him I'm an artist and I draw. And I actually was drawing a hospital sometimes. Mm. Um, and yeah, and he was like, oh, Kate is also um, into us. She doesn't draw, but she takes photos. And he was showing me on his phone, like all the phys- like photographs and stuff. That's and I was, awesome. yeah, it was really nice. And That's then my dad awesome. pulled out with the souvenirs, <laughs> with the fridge magnets from his biggest. <laughs> <laughs> and I specifically picked one of the magnets that was like um, an Uzbek man and a woman. Mm. And I was like, oh, Wills, we got, we got a present for you. <laughs> And then my mom was like, oh, can we take a photo of you? Because um, you're her childhood crush. Mm. And yeah, that's the photo. And my dad uh, printed it out and put it on mugs for, as a souvenir <laughs> for the family members in Uzbekistan for my booby John. <laughs> that's amazing. And he starts selling them. <laughs> no, he didn't sell them, but he definitely did promote to every family member out there that we have. We have a huge family. Mm. I mean, there's eight, eight siblings um, in my dad's family. So we have... I have 25 first cousins, so all of them have a mug. Each of them has a mug somewhere in the kitchen (laughs) with me and Prince William. (laughs) That's amazing. Did they have to go to your room and check, make sure there's no bombs or anything? No, no. I was in the intensive care unit when they visited. I don't know, dude. No, no. There was six of us. I mean, um, I was the youngest. Everyone else was in their 40s, 50s, 70s, why not? And most of them were so drugged up that they didn't realize that Prince William was missing that. I was the only one who was, yeah, exactly. I was the only one who was semi-normal. Um, well, I don't no, know about semi-normal, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know what I mean? I was the only one who could make a conversation, even though I was very high. Mm-hmm. Most of the time I was just smiling. I don't think he could even see my eyes because my eyes were so smiling and my cheeks were so up high. <laughs> <laughs> You're both high, high from drugs and high from meeting him. Exactly, exactly. It was a double of everything. I know you were da- your dad was happy that meeting Prince William, but I think he would have preferred meeting you, Grant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe, maybe. I'll ask him later on this. <laughs> I like that you talk about the surgery because my second question will be, can you tell the story about you waking up from your second surgery and having an epiphany? How do you know this? Don't worry about it. <laughs> where, did, where did I write this? Oh my gosh. Um, yes. Um, before I was diagnosed, um, and as mentioned before, I had a, a, a very hard time at home. My mom got remarried, and unfortunately, she 
didn't marry a very nice man and uh, we went through domestic violence and abuse at home mm. which we were always we were also hiding up from dad uh, and um my mom was always too scared to leave because we we're in a foreign country at the end of the day we're immigrants mm. you know you don't want to be alone out there on the streets nowhere to go kind of kind of situation um and once I was diagnosed and after I woke up, I, I did have a dream. You know how everyone says, you know, when you go through a near death experience, you have a dream. I did have a dream. Mm. And when I woke up from the dream, my mom remembers it even because I, I blurred it out to her. So I don't forget it. And I told her, that's it. We, we need to, we need to make changes in our lives. That's it. That's now is the time. Like, after that dream after I woke up after that surgery I had an epiphany that there's no way I'm going to stop holding myself back to living my best life ever mm. I'm done it doesn't matter if we're going to be out on the street so what at least we're going to live the life that we wanted I'm done I'm done being scared I'm done being anxious I'm done mm. and yeah do you mind me asking about was the boyfriend hitting you or, or your mom uh, my mom's husband um, mm. yes yeah, so Throughout the years at home, it was um, it was abuse. It was verbal abuse, emotional abuse, uh, racial, and um, and at the end, it became physical. Mm. Um, and he did try to physically abuse me as well. Like um, at once, I did have um, bruises on my hands, but I told him straight away, "If you ever do that, I'm going to go to school." go to college and I will make a complaint official complaint so he never he never even tried but when I was in hospital obviously most of the time I was in hospital I don't mm. know what's happening at home but at mm. home it, it, it was getting physical with my mom it was it was getting bad mm. and I realized it got really bad after I came back home after my surgery and I was recovering at home that's when I witnessed it and that's when I realized that's it we're done mm. um he he put his hand on my mom and that's when I was like, you know what? I'm done with the situation. If not now, then when? Mm -hmm. And because my mom was too scared, I had to be the one to take the action. And unfortunately, at the time, my mom was out of job. She she wasn't working at the time. And we had, I think, maybe 50 pounds between us. Mm -hmm. And after that happened, that incident happened, for our, the, at night, we packed 10 years of our lives into suitcases, 50 pounds between us. And we left and we never looked back. And my mom was way too scared. She was like, no, Cami, like, you know, let's, let's wait, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, we're not going to wait. I researched what, what can be done in UK and how women can be supported in this, in this situation. Mm. And I quickly made action. How old were you then? And I was still 17, 18. Oh, man. Yeah. And I was still, um, I had to continue my studies because, um, after the surgery, I had to take time off. I couldn't go back to university, um, to college to continue uh, mm. my A-levels. And yeah. Wow. Mom and I, after that situation, mom and I lived in one in one room um, for two years while I was continuing my A-levels before university and whilst my mom was getting back up on her feet. And eventually dad did find out and he started helping us financially a little, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Was he Russian, the guy? No, no, he was British. No, oh. a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. But where was your uh, brother? My brother. Um, so my brother came with us to London um, when I was eleven. He was seventeen at the time. But um, he moved back to Uzbekistan mm. because he married very young. He married at nineteen. So mm. he was like, I'm, I'm going to continue my life and my family back home. So he immigrated back. Oh, they met in Uzbekistan? Yes, yes. He married his childhood sweetheart. Mm, okay. So it's just you and mom, man. That must be yeah. terrifying. It was, but there was no time to be terrified. <laughs> when you're in a situation, you have to be proactive. Um, of course, there were a lot of emotions, but... I've learned to deal with emotions later. When mm. you're in a situation, you need to be proactive. You need to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Man, 60, yeah. 70 <laughs> with cancer and then this shit <laughs> happening at home. 
<laughs> I know, I know, I know. It, it was. It felt like um, I've always been taught by my parents that life is not one singular horizontal straight line. It will mm. always be curvy. It will always be linear. It will no. It will never be one straight line. Mm-hmm. But looking back at the time, it felt like my life was a tsunami, of mm. like tsunami of events. Some are good, some are bad, some are very horrific, and some are very great. Mm. And it felt like I was suffocating and drowning at times, but I was fighting mm. through it. Um, and I was fighting through it with art, as you can see. Mm-hmm. And I was fighting through it for being proactive. Um, and at the end of the day, I wasn't alone at all. I met also different women who went through different situations from different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were supportive for one another. And with few of them, I stayed in touch and we're still friends. Mm-hmm. When you ran away, where did you guys go? It was there like a woman's shelter? Yes, yes. So we first went to the police um, and the police mentioned um, you have two choices. You either report him and we do your restraining order, but he will know where you live. So he might send his friends. Oh my um, God. Y- yeah. And the second option is you go to a completely different part of London and you try to find a refuge through the council, mm-hmm. like the authority of, of that area. So we went to uh, the council that was um, close to my college, mm-hmm. the college I was enrolled to. So I thought it will be, be more logical that way. And it'll be, it's completely opposite end of London. So yeah. We went to we went there and it wasn't straightforward. The process was not straightforward at all. Mm. Um, at first, they were sending us to like Airbnbs for a night. Uh, sometimes they were sending us for a week, like a hotel. Before we, they gave us like this refuge to live in. That's when Mom and I lived in like one one room. And it was covered by the government, or you guys have to pay for it. Yes, yes, the government was helping us out. Yep. But then yeah. you still have to work because you know, food. Exactly. So that's when my mom was um, working on um, getting back on the feet as well. Yeah. And the college I was enrolled in, they also knew the situation mm. because obviously domestic abuse and violence and they have to protect. And I remember I was going into college and going back and the security at the gates, like they knew me. And I was wondering, why did they know me? And because uh, they were informed, just, just, just in case, be protective of this student. How did that make you feel? The situation or... Well, everyone knowing your business. Um, they needed to know. How else would I? How else would I be helped? Mm-hmm. And thank God they did because um, that's how I was put through um, to university through winning a bursary. I mm-hmm. aced my studies, and they knew that I aced my studies, and they helped with bursaries and putting me through different kind of foundations and stuff to help me um, get to university financially. Mm-hmm. They had to know. How else would I get help? The help is there. Might as well, like, take it. There's no time for your ego. There's no time for your pride. Of course. Was there a moment that you and your mom fought because she wanted to come back to him? Uh, yes. She At first, she was really scared. Um, she, my mom has never lived on her own before, ever. Mm-hmm. And she didn't know what it's like to pay bills on her own. Um. Of course, she was always working, but she still never paid bills on her own. Like all these little things. Um, so she was very scared. And that's when she was like, oh, maybe we made the wrong decision. You know, we don't know what the future holds, mm. you know. And there were times of, you know, we didn't have any hope sometimes. And we would wake up in the morning and I'll, sometimes we would have extra 10, 20 pounds uh, on a weekly budget. And I'm like, mom, it's a sunny day. Let's go to park. Let's get ourselves coffees and let's mm. talk about the future. Mm. And that's what we did to to be positive, talk about the future, visualizing, manifesting, but also be proactive about it, just like my parents did with moving to London. That's amazing, man. You, yo, props to you, man. You're like uh, <laughs> seventeen. I'm like, I don't even know what the difference between my ass and my elbow. <laughs> well, yeah, and um, I guess I wasn't. I wasn't very lucky in some in some ways in some mm. circumstances, but it taught me a lot. And mm-hmm. to be where I am today, it, it was one hell of a long journey. Let me tell you that. <laughs> I'm sure, man. I admire you. That's amazing. Thank you. To Thank be you. there for yourself and for your mom and acing studies. Yeah, I, I mean, 
I I'm, I gave myself a mission the way my parents gave themselves a mission. I was like, I'm going to focus on studies. Mm. I'm going to go and get my university degree. I'm going to go and get my own money. I'm going to live and make sure um, I can provide for myself. Like mm. I have to do it. I have to do it. And I was focusing on that constantly. Mm. If I have a bad day, I was focusing on that. Mm. How's mom doing now? She's good. Um, after I was done in with my A-levels in college, mom and I moved into our own um, apartments. We live on the same road, actually. We live across the road. So mm. I live in my own studio flat, and my mom lives in her own flat across the road. That's beautiful. And she, she's practicing. Um, she's a practitioner, practitioner uh, as well as a maternity nurse. So, oh, um, she's a nurse? Maternity nurse, yes. She works What's with that? babies. Oh, so, maternity. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So like newborns and stuff. And she's also big on spirituality and meditation and um, sound baths, if you know mm, what I mean, like yeah, with the yeah. crystal baths. She collects yeah. them. She has tons of them at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's big on oils and, yeah. That's awesome. So you've graduated as an interior architect, right? First of yeah. all, what does an interior architect does? I know. Everyone asks me this question. <laughs> so... I had I had two choices when I was um, going into university. It's either architecture, which is uh, five years and two years of practice, which overall was seven years, or mm-hmm. interior architecture, which is very similar. You basically have the same modules as architects, where you focus on interior architecture. So um, not just interior design, but also um, what's going on between the walls and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, I don't want to I don't want to spend seven years of my life before I start making money, I don't have time. So I'm going to go for interior architecture. And somewhere midway, I realized I do not want to do this. <laughs> but because I'm so stubborn, I just continue with the studies. Hmm. Um, and just like every other member in my family, I graduated architecture degree. I'm a Question. seventh person to study architecture. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're not very creative. <laughs> Well, with our degrees, <laughs> but you know, it's a pattern, right? Like, well, if he's doing that and he's successful, I might do that too. So I'll be successful. Yes. Yes. We had, we, my eldest uncle, uh, he was a very successful architect in Uzbekistan hmm. and very well known in his circles. And growing up, we always used to visit him, um, hmm. like every Sunday. And he lived in this amazing, beautiful, um, house in the neighborhood. Hmm. And I always thought like, I always thought once I grow up, I'm going to be like him. Mm. But I didn't know that every other cousin in my family also thought the same. Well, of course, he's the one, he's the star, you know, everybody's looking at the star. So I'm the seventh, basically, in a family to study, but I'm the only female. So I'm Mm. proud of that. What's up? What's up, Holmes? Exactly. Exactly. I wanted to be an architect when I was young because my uncle was an architect or is an architect. Ah. And then I realized uh-huh. I'm stupid with math. I'm like, fuck this. I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I had, I had something. I had the same similar epiphany somewhere midway of my degree. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's funny, man. I love your blog stories about your artworks. And ah, thank you. One that struck me the most was the question your dad asked you about drawing God, love, and anger. Yes. That's heavy. Um, yes. Uh, so my dad is not a big fan of surrealism at all, but he <laughs> <laughs> he's a very um, traditional Uzbek man who believes you know art has to be uh, straightforward. Mm. Um, there's hidden messages between my artwork, um, mm. but not everyone gets them. But anyway, so when I was a teenager, uh, I had art exam and we had to prepare with coursework. So I was drawing a lot on us. On us, we we went to summer. I came to the summer holiday to Uzbekistan at the time, and I was preparing. And my dad looks at my artwork and he's like, "I don't understand your work." I was like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> he's like, "Well, there's nothing in it." And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, dad!" And he was like, "Well, you know, if I ask you to draw Allah, can you can you draw? Can you draw Allah?" I was like, "Well, I don't know. Maybe I'll give it a go." Can you I draw Allah? That, yeah, you're not allowed, no. No, you're not allowed. But he's like you know, this this feeling inside of you. Because obviously mm. Allah is not a man and a woman. It's not a physical, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a spirit. Mm. But he, what he's saying is, can you draw a spirit, mm. this ho- holy spirit inside of you? Can you draw love that you feel inside of you? Mm. Can you draw anger that you feel inside of you? Mm. And I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll give it a go, I guess. 
like damn dad relax um, dad yeah yeah but he he was he was like very he was like on it to challenge me he always mm. challenged me that's the thing mm. and that's when i started to draw my emotions and that's when my artwork became a very direct bridge of my emotions and myself mm. um so yeah can you explain the style of your drawing because I love this. And I did a research about your style, where it came from, like the who first had the idea of like a body of a person and then the head is like something else. Yes. Uh, God, <laughs> I wonder what you read now. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I didn't know I have a style until like recently, until someone pointed out as well. Mm. Like obviously I, I draw a lot of florals and stuff like that. I don't know. I mean, I just, I just, what I feel inside, I just draw it. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of, just, I, I kind of describe it. I honestly cannot define it either. Mm-hmm. You well, know, something happens. To simplify, it's like you draw a body of a human being, but the head will be a floor, like a flower. It could be any y- yeah, flower. Yeah, it's because I hate drawing portraits. <laughs> I'm not good at drawing portraits. I hate drawing portraits, mm. but I I love drawing. Um, you know, physical. I like to to express um the reality with what's inside of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that's that's why I draw bodies with flowers. Oh, I love it. Like <laughs> I like I think we're on offline. Is I was talking about the blooming. It's my favorite yes, one. Yes, blooming. Yes, the one I drew on my birthday, and that's when I was like. You know, this year is going to be the year of me blooming. Blooming from what? Blooming from pain and anger and this uh, discrimination that mm. I've experienced. And I'm going to let it go and I'm going to bloom and thrive even harder from it. Do you still feel anger from the domestic abuse or the cancer? No, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, I don't I don't have... Um, attachment or emotional feeling towards it at all Mm. um first of all the the person i experienced domestic abuse from he passed away Mm -hmm. so what what is there to say i don't need a closure you know it happened it's a shitty thing that happened i don't need a closure from it i moved on from it i've moved on from the situation but when it comes to um the illness i check up every year i still do Mm-hmm. I check up on my symptoms. Um, recently, if you may have seen on Instagram, I have experienced the symptoms and I have to check up and make sure that all is clear. Mm-hmm. Um, I do still have that healthy anxiety, if you may call it that, to check up just in case. Because mm-hmm. um, I don't want the same story to be repeated again. I don't have time for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got things to do. I don't have time for it. <laughs> you got life to live. Exactly. I got to hustle. <laughs> gotta hustle <laughs> by the way did you ever draw Allah love and anger and you show it to your dad and dad like finally agreed that you do yes 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 okay, okay. um my dad is one of my biggest fans mm-hmm. so although my dad never understood uh surrealism and what i draw and stuff like that he was he always supported me and he always he knows whatever i draw like something new hmm. he, he knows that he sees it he understands that not always though, but he he loves it. That's dad being dad. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's dad being dad. He never understood it, but he was um, supportive. He always got me tutors to teach me different techniques. He mm. always took me to exhibitions in Uzbekistan. Whatever that's new and happening, he will take me. Mm-hmm. Um, we will talk about it. That's amazing. You use watercolor, right? Yeah, watercolor, acrylics, pencils, um, graphic liners. I could never understand watercolor. Like, Why? It's not, I don't know. It's like so hard. <laughs> like I love it. <laughs> it's one of my favorite techniques. But I'm like, how? Because you put the water and then the paint and then it goes all over the place. <laughs> That's why I love it. It gets messy. You can play around with a mess. You can get uh, creative with it. And you have to do it quickly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, And then the color is just so faint. The beauty with it is that you have to let go of all the expectations that you have when it comes to creating the image and just go along with that. Listen, Camila, 
I'm a control freak, so it's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. You know what you should do? Color by uh, numbers. That's I can tell that that's your thing, maybe. No, I, th- I no? hate that. No, I oh, do my, never like, mind. whatever, how I feel, that's what okay. I draw. That's it. But I, I like writing, so that's what my my focus on. I would like to I draw also... watercolor. <laughs> Try it. Keep on practicing it. No nah. one's stopping you. Nah, I, okay, I told fine. you I don't have that like, like oh let it go. I'm like yo no. I want... <laughs> Let's <a> flow. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean. Well, you do you. Oh, of course. Thank you. So, how do you draw? Do you when it comes and then you draw, or you just sit down and then draw? Yes, usually um, I rarely draw when I'm happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if something happens and um, it, it might be something in my personal life mm-hmm. um, a certain situation might have happened um, I feel discriminated I feel judged or whatever I'm going through I feel this emotion and I think of how I feel and how I can express it and on paper and I come up with different ideas I look through different examples of course um, and just draw it out and at first I just draw a pencil like a pencil drawing like sketch mm-hmm. it out and then I'll go with watercolors and sometimes I go many, many times before I get to the perfect image that I want to mm. show to the whole world. I love that you said that you only draw when you're sad or, you know, discriminated. Yeah. Because I write the same way. Like, I don't write when I'm happy. I can't. I don't know why. Yeah. Because it's a communication tool for you as well. I don't know. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I, I just write. You know? <laughs> but I, I you're also just being like, humble. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I also like that what you said that, oh, I draw it on with a pencil and then eventually I'll work on it. Because people think like, oh, she just draws it. Like, no, it's, there's a lot of work. No, it's, it's, it's process. It's, it's process just like with cooking, for instance. You mm-hmm. don't just throw a vegetable in a pan and be like, yeah, that's it, it's done. <laughs> you, you know, you, you go through the process stage by stage, of course. Mm. Exactly. I also like the poppy-eyed piece that you did. Ah, yes. Very, very red. It's, it's one on there on one of my walls as well. Yeah. What was the inspiration behind it? Oh gosh, I don't remember. I think I must have been angry at someone. It's so red. <laughs> it is. It's so red. I must have been angry at someone or something. Don't remember it mm. at all. Once you draw, do you usually remember what it was, or you just let it go? Sometimes I do. There are some pieces which I'm not selling. Um, mm. There's some pieces I just gift to friends and families, and they're very like very colorful, warm pieces. Um, these are the pieces that um, that I don't that, that I do remember the story behind them. You know, my first heartbreak, for instance, um, I drew a heart, a blooming heart, um, with bees and birds and hands holding the heart and the flowers growing out of it. And people are like, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. It's very um, fragile, very mm. warm. But there's a heartbreak behind it. There's a one hell of a hell heartbreak behind it. <laughs> but that's the thing. Um, no one knows about it. So I would rather, you know, have them associate um, an artwork mm. with this beautiful, warm feeling rather than my big ass heartbreak. <laughs> but do you feel resentment towards those people that says, oh, this is beautiful. This is colorful. This is, you know, no, positive. No, 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 not, not at all. Not at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. No. When people gives meaning to your artwork, yeah. Do you let them do whatever they want to feel, or you prefer to like for them to understand what you're trying to accomplish? I let them feel what they need to feel for it. I let them, unless they ask me, uh, "What's the story behind this?" Then I will tell them. Or sometimes people feel something very similar to what I feel. Like, especially with sunflowers, one of the popular drawings, um, it was the sunflowers and a lot of people resonated with it. You know, it's it's very warm. It's very um, colorful. Um, they feel it within themselves. It's really, it's one of the most popular ones. And they tell me the story and I resonate with them. It's very similar. So in most cases, I let them feel what they need to feel for it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Because I don't know, I'm like, a, I'm big on like artists that, forces the meaning of their art to other people. Mm. 
knowing what you know now, would you have just jumped in the deepest end and tried to be an artist earlier in life? You mean like sell art or actually? Yeah, yeah. just be an artist fully. Um, I actually did want to be like an artist fully before mm. before I went to university. Mm. Um, I don't know. I don't regret it. I don't regret how I live now and, and the choices I've made and the mm. decisions I've made at all. Uh, I don't regret it. So maybe I should have started setting my artwork earlier, but I was not ready back then. And there were other reasons why I wasn't ready back then. Yeah. You're ready when you're ready. Exactly. You're ready when you're ready. And there's no need to rush it. You have your own life to fulfill. Everyone mm. has their own timeline. Yeah. Last question before we close up. Mm -hmm. What is the most important lesson you've learned in life? Oh, right. This is, <laughs> there's a lot of them. But I think one of the main one is when I was going through a cultural crisis and identity crisis. Um, I think everyone feels that, every immigrant. Um, something that I've learned is um, I was discriminated against for the fact that I'm not full-blooded. It was the fact that I'm mixed. And... Um, it was here in London that I was discriminated mm. against. And it took me a long time to understand that at the end of the day, it's not who you are, it's what you're about. And the people that discriminated me against the fact that I'm not 100% of something, they were just projecting whatever is going on within them on me. And yeah, I think, I think one, that's one of the lessons I've learned. Mm. Beautiful. Again. <laughs> Jamila, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for inviting. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Have a great day. Bye. Again, Camila, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, listeners, for listening. This is Aaron DeLiosa for An Immigrant's Life. I'll see you guys later. <laughs>